Hello. So, I'm doing a video now today about the Philip K. Dick book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And, I mean, so far I've been making a bunch of video blogs. I was just posting them straight to Facebook for a while. These days I'm taking a break from Facebook for Lint, actually, as a kind of a format of 40 days Facebook free, and I've been posting things on YouTube. Um, previously, most of my video blogs were following a format of um, the theme or topic about things like spiritual emergency, mental health, psychiatry, anti-psychiatry, and just but in a kind of loose sense, like just kind of around those kinds of themes. Um, and this is a bit of a departure from that, seeing as I'm not really, I don't really have that in mind with this. This is basically me talking about this Philip K. Dick book. Um, Ta-da, here it is. <laughs> so, um, now I read this book after watching the new Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049 movie that came out. And as I'm sure most people know that this book was the basis or inspiration for the original Blade Runner that came out, which kind of made a name for Philip K. Dick. And of course, it's one of the most, you know, famous, popular sci-fi movies of all time. Um, and I've also been, through this period of time, I've been following along with these Richard Doyle talks that you can look up on YouTube. Um, that where he's been each week, they had a book club where they're reading a book each week, and I thought his talk on androids was pretty great. Um, I'm, but th this is this is my thing about it, going exploring it. Um, I mean, one of the things that Richard Doyle brought up in his talk was that Philip K. Dick himself was not happy at all, really, with Blade Runner when it came out, and it's kind of funny because I think, anyways, that. Um, so many people really praise Blade Runner. Um, it's got quite a following of fans. Um, it's kind of this cult classic new movie. It's a big part of our culture, but Phil hated it when it came out. Um, and to actually read his book, I think um, it becomes quite apparent because although in a sense they, there's a few scenes where they might follow it pretty... Um, accurately or you know they kind of the basic you know chunk of the plot is sort you know it's not totally an entirely different thing than androids but what they leave out is huge and that um i would say like uh for three basic things there's the idea of um mercerism um which has to do and well, i suppose there's, there's mercerism where they're actually using this machine to have this collective experience with this almost kind of like Christ figure called Mercer. Um, and then tied in with that, there's also this thing about empathy and owning electronic pets. Well, actually, to, to own pets in general um, uh, to sort of foster empathy and compassion. There's this character Buster Friendly as a kind of a TV show, um, which is airing all the time as a kind of a cheesy talk show. Um, and then there's this whole idea of Kipple, um, which is sort of like the junk that's sort of uh, accumulating, a bit kind of like garbage, basically. Um, and like, I think while, so with all these things, it would be kind of, you, you to make a sequel to Blade Runner and reintroduce the stuff that got left out, like uh, Buster Friendly and Mercerism and the pets and all this kind of stuff, it would be, you know, you can't really do that because it would be uh, kind of turning it into an entirely different movie. You kind of have to work, as a sequel, you have to work with the movie that was there. But what I thought was really cool about the new Blade Runner movie, um, especially, you know, because I... I reading the book afterwards, I could see this, is that if you look at this idea of Kipple, that they have lots of powerful imagery in the new Blade Runner movie to do with Kipple, um, namely 
they have shots of these big kind of floating garbage trucks just dumping masses amount of trash and these you know the world has become a kind of like a big trash heap more or less and there's also a very kind of uh, powerful scene where they've got um, you know this kind of the idea of e-waste you've got all these because uh, all our so much of our electronics you know even this phone that I'm shooting this on is uh, planned obsolescence you know that everybody buys a new phone every year you buy a new computer every few years and all this kind of stuff I'm I hopefully <laughs> most people aren't completely ignorant of this kind of thing um, and so in this view of the future you've got like forced child labor camps in the slums of all these kids picking apart all these circuit boards where there are just at this point it's just endless the amount of e-waste garbage we have and this is that this idea of kipple is very relevant um to our society uh because you know this this, this idea of kippleization if we're talking about this phone i'm recording on um you know part of the reason why this phone is useful um is it's an older model and I haven't upgraded the operating system. And what people are complaining with Apple phones it is if you, if I were to, you know, I'm getting nagged by Apple on my phone to always uh, update the, the OS, but people say that if you have an older phone, it gets bricked basically, which is to say it gets kippleized. And then all of a sudden your phone is useless, it, it turns into kipple and you have to buy a new phone only for that phone to become kippleized in a few years. And then for the world to be overrun with junk basically like electronic things you can't use um not to mention you know like uh whatever like at a more basic level even just all the packaging and stuff like that for our products um and this is a kind of a surface level but um there you know maybe i'll get into it a bit later there's also things like you could talk about in a more abstract sense cultural kiplization um, which is the kind of degradation of our society or communities uh, and stuff like that. And I think in, in a sense this also sort of plays into um, the book and maybe the new movie. One, one thing that, as a as kind of a subtle thing that the original Blade Runner got wrong, well, you know, I, I, we're diverted from the book, was that in Blade Runner, in, in Androids, there's a big um, theme of kind of isolation, loneliness, um, and if you take the character J.R. Uh, Isidore, yeah I guess it would be Isidore would be how you say his name, that he, in the book he lives in the suburbs and at this point because so many people have emigrated to the Martian colonies that most people are living in the cities but in the, in the suburbs it's like he's probably the only living being let alone human around for miles and miles and miles and so he just lives in this ba vast kind of expanse of emptiness and that when he turns off his tv it's just this overwhelming kind of silence um of you know void of life um void of activity and in oh, i think they kind of missed that in the original blade runner movie because it looks like jack isidore or jr isidore what's his name what? um he lives in a, uh, he looks like he's just living around in the city, around the corner from where all this action is happening. And he does live in an empty apartment building, like in the book. But there, the, most of the scenes in Blade Runner, you've got crowded city streets where this hustle bustle of all these people and stuff like that. And to me, it doesn't really sort of, it, it misses this theme of being, this kind of desolation of there no, nobody being around. and being completely left behind on Earth kind of thing. I think that's kind of been missed out in Blade Runner. But the new one, um, I think it captures this because you have much more shots of these big empty spaces um, that have become kind of run down and ruined and where there's little to no life and, and stuff like that. So I think these are kind of the things that the new movie tries to recapture some of the themes in the book even but on a more visual kind of thematic symbolistic level rather than um, it being them talking about the capitalization process and them talking about I think a good example of this in the new movie is when they uh, introduced Harrison Ford's uh, Rick Deckard character again is that he's living kind of like J.R. Isidore was far away from the city in this big kind of like 
hotel casino kind of thing uh, and he probably hasn't seen a, a person for decades right and he's just completely isolated you know living in exile basically and that I think captures some of the stuff going on in androids which which was sort of left out of Blade Runner um, And the thing about this thing, I'm, I'm almost considering like maybe I should make a series of videos on <laughs> and on do androids. I'll try to like see if I can get through most of it in one video though. But it's just so loaded with thematic content that it's it's there's a lot to cover, and I'm not. I just kind of do these things like um, rather than trying to write everything out. Like I've got a um, <laughs> I'm trying to just go with the flow with it. Um, but I mean, I did take, take some notes as I was reading. Um, the book, and I think um, a good place to maybe launch off from with some of these themes is there. there's a quote in this book that really struck me um, because it seems kind of like a recurring theme throughout Phil's work. Um, and so we're just talking about Kipple. Um, it's page 66 of Androids. It's a universal principle operating throughout the universe. The entire universe is moving toward a final state of total, absolute kippleization, he added. Or, he added. <laughs> Except, of course, for the upward climb of Wilbur Mercer. And before, before I'm reading Androids, I've read his book, Ubik. And so me, first of all, this struck me as being like, this is kind of like the theme of Ubik in a kind of proto-form emerging in in his uh, in his book androids mixed in with a lot of other stuff going on um and and this is also like this, this is a very strong one too because i think a lot of the exegesis um is sort of working with this theme um you could compare it to this process of thermodynamics um of the 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 dissipation of heat and energy being kind of tied into this kind of kippleization and um, I was just, I picked up the exegesis again without having kind of bothered with it for years because it's kind of a dense, <laughs> big book. And this is just the print volume. There's more to it in the online. Um, but in, in the, the part I was reading the other day, they were talking about this um, uh, Russian scientist, Nikolai Kozarev. And um, I mean, this is a kind of a big thing to get into, but, um, you know, Phil was having all these really abstract ideas based on Kozarev uh, about the nature of time and that time is really running backwards and that the what we see as dissipation is a reverse time and that really uh, is sort of like, are we heading away from the Big Bang or are we heading towards it? Or And, and that time is a kind of like holographic overlay of these two time streams. I mean, this is pretty abstract, but there's also interesting, I looked up, just to, to get a bit more on Kozarev, I looked at a, uh, you know, a short little Russian TV documentary on him, and they mentioned this thing that Kozarev, like, I'm not a scientist, so I can't really, like, verify this, but what they're talking about with Kozarev's ideas was that Apparently, if you look at like the law of thermodynamics, that um, th there's things going on in the universe, like take our own sun, for example, that if we look at the law of thermodynamics, that it's like uh, dissipating energy and the sun's burning ball of gas. It's sort of like, you know, like, it's like if you've got like a lamp or a candle, it's got a set amount of fuel and it's burning away. And eventually, once it burns out, there there's isn't going to be any fuel left or something like that. Um, well, going on this theory of how stars work, that apparently, based on what we understand the age of our sun to be, that our sun should have burnt out a long time ago, um, and that most of that so this is the idea is that there's um, this sort of dissipation that there's something else at play here because if it was just this sort of dissipation of thermodynamics, um, then. Uh, then everything would already be kaput by now. There's something else, other process at work. Um, and so, and then, so if you look at that um, quote there, that everything's turning into a complete up state of uh, civilization except for the upward climb of Mercer. And then, and, and, and Kozarev was a, kind of unique because he was a kind of a, became a spiritual scientist. He was seeing that the, uh, uh, there, you know, that there's, there's, 
well, it, it, I won't get, get too into that now, but maybe that's something, if that, that's interesting to you, you can kind of explore on your own. Um, but, so now we, we lead into things like Mercerism, um, and, and these other main themes to get into. Now, I, I, I've, I've kind of like left a few weeks space between actually reading this book and doing this now. Um, but from what I know, like, this sort of Mercerism seems like it has kind of two parts to it. There's Mercerism as in uh, this machine that people hold, they, they hold on to these bars and they have this sort of kind of, they, they uh, leave their normal state of reality and, and experience the world of Mercer, who is a kind of uh, Christ-like figure who's climbing up a mountain. It seems a bit like that kind of myth of, myth of Sisyphus kind of thing going on there. Um, and so people kind of have everybody tuning into this. So it has a collective experience of this guy going through his trials. He's getting rocks thrown at him. And it's, it's there is a kind of empathy thing um, for people. And I suppose part of this kind of the implication here of why this kind of mercerism came up is that it's like a um, that in the society where Af it's kind of a dystopian post-apocalyptic kind of situation where everybody's leaving Earth and Earth is is Earth itself is kind of becoming kippalized. I mean, not just kind of. It's that's the situation, uh, and that as a kind of antidote for the kind of hopelessness of that, then they felt it um, necessary to try to um, institute institute this kind of practice of empathy um, to be compassionate towards your fellow man um, to to foster that kind of caring and hope rather than this the descent into like nihilism basically um, and so for this you know I think it's a it's it's on that level it's a kind of um, a noble and kind of worthy pursuit, um, I would say, because uh, you know, fostering compassion and caring for your fellow man, it all sounds all good. Um, and another component of this in the book is they had it as a mandatory thing that people had to own pets and care for their pets, and and this is this also plays into that as a part of this whole nuclear fallout from this devastating war. Um, the World War Terminus, they call it in the book, um, that the animals all started going extinct. Um, and, you know, th this is something we don't, we haven't, li <laughs> fortunately, with, despite all the doom and gloom stuff going on in the news about, you know, Trump and North Korea, we haven't had this kind of situation happen yet. Um, but, but regardless of that, we, we a lot of people are talking about how we are facing, um, you know, this extinction thing happening. Uh, where we're we're destroying the habitats and uh, of uh, <laughs> of the 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 environment and all this kind of stuff and with global warming and all of that is that we're facing a big ex extinction. Um, so this is all this is all just this isn't just like made up um, stuff. This is actually things that we're dealing with in a very literal sense in our society. And it'll be interesting to see you know fifty years from now uh, what the situation is. Um, or, you know, maybe even shorter than that. Um, so, w w without the animals becoming completely entirely extinct, there's a few of the, you know, it would be, they became a kind of a rarefied commodity, and so they had this thing that everybody had to own a pet, um, not just to sort of keep the animals alive and, you know, kind of as a conserva conservatory kind of conservation of the animal life, but to foster the human uh, caring empathy to care for these animals and all this kind of stuff. Um, and this in the book, this is where it gets interesting because people cannot, they, because these animals are rare, they're also very expensive um, to actually purchase these sort of last few animals that are around. Um, and so they, there's a market there for Android animals, the electric sheep, um, and whatnot. And the, the story about uh, Rick Deckard in this book is that originally he had a sheep, a real live sheep, and then one day it got tetanus and it died, and then he replaced it with an electric sheep. 
Um, and this is really interesting because I can tie this in with uh, a while ago, I was for the first time I was looking into Guy Debord and his the Situationist movement. Um, and for me, I, maybe maybe there's more to it, but I've kind of boiled down a main thing that for of Situationism to me is the kind of thing. Um, there's, there's a line where rather than rather than the, the reality of being, um, you know, the, the really being empathetic in this case. Um, really being virtuous or a good person or something like that. Um, that in this, Guy Debord is talking about how in a post-capitalist society, in capitalism it's not about, um, it's not about uh, being or what you really are, it's about what you have. And then from that it's not about what you really have, it's what you appear to have or what you appear to be. And so there's this kind of thing about um, uh, superficial appearances and this is kind of so I, th I think at its heart if you take that theme androids is kind of like an, a situationist um, science fiction novel in a way because you've got this thing about appearances um, where people can't tell there, there's, there's two situations in the book where people can't tell the difference between the electric animal and the real thing. At first, like in the beginning of the book, somebody, um, they have, uh, Isidore works for a, uh, uh, a so-called animal hospital, where it's really it's set up to look, service these electric pets. Um, and, but somebody turns in a, uh, a real cat that's dying to them instead. Um, because I think, I think the, the, because they, they mix it up, they think that they're a legit animal hospital. Um, and then later on in the end of the book, um, Deckard finds a toad, I guess, um, and the, he he is really excited because he he thinks he's found a real toad. Um, and this is part of the conclusion to the book after all the actions wind down, and that he's found one of these last remaining toads of the last remaining life forms, and he finds out it is in fact actually just a. Uh, uh, android or a, a replicant if you want to use the Blade Runner term um, and so th in this sense there's a kind of thing um, wh where is the, the difference between the appearance and the real deal and um, what's interesting about the uh, this whole practice of caring for these pets is that it becomes a kind of a superficial thing, really. It's not, it ends up being less about the actual practice of feeling the empathy for these animals and more of uh, social status, basically, um, of keeping up appearances. Um, so it doesn't, so it, the, it's not so much important whether or not, whether you actually are empathetic, it's just whether you have project this image that you are, right? Um, and so for it's interesting the character of Deckard because he's he's um at no point does it really seem like he really cares that much for empathizing with an animal or empathizing with a fake animal most of this is so that he can keep his wife happy um and so that they fit in with their um you know the rest of the people in their apartment building and and uh and and uh, you know, to be, to 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 fit in with this sort of cultural norm, um, and so he's more interested in this process of looking at the catalogs and checking the prices and making deals and bartering, and all this kind of stuff has sort of taken over the actual what it was supposed to be in the first place. And then there's this question beneath all that is that if he's getting an electric substitution, can can you even empathize with a fake animal? Um, and much less, like, th at this point, this question isn't even really there because the value on um, having a real animal isn't really so much, in this sense, like, the value originally should have been that the, the, the value of the real animal was that there would be more empathy towards a real animal versus a machine, but in this sense, the value to the real animal is simply because the animal has a big price tag on it and it'll impress all your friends and all, and it's a, it's a bigger sign of social status to have a real animal. 
And whereas the android animal it has to be secret, that's why they have these secret animal hospitals. It, you, ha you have to keep up the appearance that it's, you know, that you can't let anybody know that it's really fake or something like that. But this, this is where it gets brilliant, is that the whole thing, that in that attitude towards the social status of it, that itself, you could say, is, is itself a fake. Because in this sense, it doesn't matter if the animal is real or not. If you're doing it for appearances, then it's like you, you yourself are a fake, empathetic being. You know, you d d it, so in that sense, you're not actually any better than an android anyways. You're just, you know, <laughs> it's like all about can you fool people into looking like you're empathetic rather than are you actually empathetic? Um, and this, I think, is like pretty huge because like it can get kind of controversial maybe <laughs> my points of views on this but I was relating this to um, just like looking at the kind of society that we find ourselves in now um, and I'm thinking particularly more progressive um, uh, politics um, and you know this whole thing about social justice and all that is a kind of sensitive issue that you've got a lot uh, I'm you know it's, it's a touchy subject because you've got a lot of nasty stuff around that, either from, you know, alt-right people, you know, who are whatever, MRA groups or, like, or, or, or you've got people in the social justice movement themselves being kind of nasty about it. Um, but part of, like, my observation about all this stuff, like, if you take, like, if, if you've got it as a kind of a cultural... Uh, thing going on um, and you could take any sort of issue you could take um, like I know for example I know that some churches around where I live I'm in Canada right so we have a bit of a different attitude um, <laughs> I I, I, unfortunately I don't know if it's always that different than the rest of the world but politically anyways we're more welcoming to refugees in Canada than let's say the states right now who are deporting lots of people and and uh, Australia who are, treat refugees really terribly putting them in detention camps and and um, you know maybe there's a but like so uh, something I've noticed in where I live is that there's a lot of churches that uh, make uh, a big thing about taking in refugees and so providing support for refugees and so you could you could see this as a, the kind of um, tying into the mercerism and that, that Christ empathy caring thing is that this is a good opportunity for the practice um, you know to really you know putting putting into effect what these principles stand for is to to care for the disadvantaged uh, to care for your fellow man despite their their differences or despite that you might be afraid they you know there, there might be a danger or something like that um, so but then you've got the situation where in the church setting as a kind of community culture or something like that um, uh, and even not even just the church but in general that if in the social groups you run in if, if people have these attitudes there is sort of like this question of how much of this is uh, really, you know, legitimate empathy for these people and how much of it is it for as a kind of um, status symbol almost, right? Because it, it's sort of like if I, um, you know, if, if you toe the line, right? If you have a group of friends that all care about supporting refugees or you could sub in, you know, uh, you know, gay, lesbian, L LGBT, or, you know, feminism, or animal rights, or you name it, basically. It could be any number of things, uh, environmentalism, all this kind of stuff. There's the actual issue itself, and then there is, um, if, if, if I say all the right things, then that puts me in good standing with these people, right? And so then I, I, it's building my status of being a conscientious human being um, and a, a, a good, well-to-do member of society. Um, and so, it, but the thing is, this is where it, it, it becomes where it's not actually about the, the interest 
of these other parties that that, that you're caring for it's actually self-interest because if if i have the appearance that i'm <laughs> interested in others then that benefits my own self interests and that can put me in a situation where I am um, I have social acceptance I have a good standing in society that kind of thing and this I think is what the core message of this the, this part of the book is about and so the actual book itself is really interesting because through um, you, you at the beginning of the book, you've got Deckard as a guy who doesn't really empathize all that much, and he's more kind of just doing this for appearances' sake. And then eventually, he gets to um, he has he gets his his mission, which takes place over a short period of time, basically like twenty four hour period or forty eight hours, whatever, right? Like a very and where he has got his his mission to uh, retire these androids, and then in the process of this mission, um, something happens, um, and I think it you could sort of the main thing that could probably be the sort of encounter with Luba Luft, and it, was, it isn't actually him that retires Luba Luft; it's this other uh, bounty hunter. Uh, that the character that comes up that retires her and he's actually treating her with kindness he's he he they, they meet at an art gallery and he offers to buy her um, a piece of art as an act of kindness and things like that and um, through the character of Rachel Rosen and stuff like that he starts to um, develop feelings for these androids and 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 have a kind of a moral crisis about this which before you know you rationalize it as being that even though it was these these things look they have they have the appearance of human beings that they're not actually human beings they're just machines and so you're you you don't have any more responsibility if you have this job of retiring them um because it's only real life forms that you need to be, feel empathy for. Machines are just machines, and you can retire. But, but despite these added these these kind of beliefs, these, this this point of view, he's he <laughs> he starts developing empathy towards the androids, anyways, and feels just completely rotten about the whole thing by the end of it, um, and really and starts to question his own job and and question. Um, you know what's what would be the harm because this this Luba left she wasn't causing trouble she was she was an opera singer that you know you've got this android who wants to live like a human and sing in the opera and and all this kind of thing like why is it such a uh, what's the harm in that anyways and all this kind of thing and this is interesting because if we're talking about before where the the idea of this whole get, get buying the expensive pet so it puts on the the um, appearance. Uh, for social uh, uh, social status, fitting in with society, uh, having people look at you in a good light and stuff like that. That's self-interest. But in this situation, when he starts to empathize with the androids, um, I think part of the, why you can tell that that's authentic um, is that it points to this idea of agape, which is a kind of love and compassion that's devoid of any self-interest, basically. That is, it has nothing to do with what's going to be favorable for Rick Deckard, um, and it has anything to do with compassion um, and concern for these beings. Um, th so it's, 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 not, it's all in this, the, the interest of the other and none of his interest and it actually, it actually makes his life a huge mess because his whole thing about how he survives in the world whereas before you know with having this better social status that helps you survive in society but when your job you, what, how you pay the bills how you when you get the money to buy these animals starts to come into question based on your own empathy um, and it makes your life a problem that is when you know it's actually the real deal basically um, that you're, you're not doing it for your own self-interest. It's really, it, and, 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 um, it, it's, it becomes a kind of a bummer for him, um, to, to say the least. 
But then what's to take this a bit further is that um, there's this whole thing where even as he realizes this, he still has to go through with his job and retire the remaining androids, which he does. Um, and then he, it's during these sequences of events, he has visions of this character Mercer, which comes to him. And and it's kind of interesting, still with this kind of thing about what it, what's what's authentic and what isn't. There's this whole thing about Mercer as this this whole thing where people are tuning into this 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 uh, uh, group experience where there's this guy climbing up the hill and all this kind of stuff that it, it gets called into question by the character Buster Friendly um, that it's all just baloney it's a big fake because they found r records of it be it was all just constructed in a Hollywood film studio and this kind of thing so people are getting all worked up over something that's not real kind of and so you could compare to this the, th the these questions of um, that was Jesus Christ a real human being what because there it, there's not a lot of historical evidence aside from the actual Bible itself because you have historical records of all these things that happened around that period of time but actual accounts of Jesus at that time are kind of sketchy um, but then there's the question if regardless of he's a human being is a real thing that happened or if it was just a myth a symbol it's still it, it may not actually matter because it's pointing to something that goes beyond the symbol you know like the Buddhists say a finger pointing at the moon um, and so what that is is that uh, through this idea of mercerism of uh, the symbol that comes to him and speaks to him and things like that he he realizes something that is beyond all that, which at the end of it, he goes through a kind of transformation um, and he realizes that, um, you know, what would be mercerism or, you know, the Christ compassion kind of thing in himself. Um, and he, he, he starts out being a phony in the beginning of the book and he becomes the real deal by the end of it, you could say. Um, and what I find is really brilliant about all this is that he doesn't get there by trying to be compassionate you, because and the, when there's this thing that's really interesting about it, you could compare it to almost to the Bhagavad Gita where M the Mercer comes down I don't I could try to look for the right quote here but I don't know I definitely really like but I I've made some like markings in here but I don't know if I can find it right off the top of my head but um the, the to paraphrase, anyways, Mercer comes to him and says, like, you, that you, 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 even though these things, like these killing these androids, you know it is wrong, that you'll have to do it anyways, because there's a kind of a necessity in life that we have to, we can't always do what's right, we have to do what's wrong. Uh, and in a Christian sense, this could be seen as committing a sin, that in some sense, that sin is really necessary. Um, and um, to an extent, anyways. Um, but he kind of he gets there from you know the Bag of Ad Gita. It's gearing up to battle and the moral crisis, where it's you know killing your own you know royal family and in, in battle and all this kind of stuff. And that uh, Krishna comes and says, you know, this it may not be you know the most moral thing to do, but in this circumstance, you have to do it anyways. And then um, it's in this sense, it's not. Uh, it's a, it's a complicated kind of theological thing. I'm I'm doing my best to kind of grapple with it. Um, but like, there's a uh, there's there, I it remind me of this thing I came across in the from the Bible here, uh, which is Romans twenty twenty one. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through jesus christ our lord and so this in this sense once he starts to have this moral crisis of killing these androids which he starts to feel compassion for um in order to get to the state of completion where he's he he's transformed himself he actually has to follow through with what his contract requires him to do and retire the rest of the androids to basically increase the sin and then by the process of him you, him his trespasses 
um, then the grace just amps up all the more to the point where he, at the end of the book, I would say he's a transformed person, that he's realized his own true compassionate heart, not by trying to be compassionate, but by seeing all, by see, by becoming aware of his own, um, his own sin or his own, uh, shortcomings, his own, uh, moral crisis. So, and this is, uh, there's a guy I like Richard Rohr and he often says that we don't get to, to God or whatever by doing it right. We get there by doing it wrong. Uh, and so I think this is a great theme in Androids is that he sort of, he finds his redemption, but it's, and the thing is, it's not, it's authentic redemption because he's not trying to do, he, at this point, if, if he could do what a redeemed person would do, he would already be redeemed and he wouldn't have to go through this process. I, you see? Um, so, in his, but he, this isn't the story. This isn't some guy who's made it there and is living a, uh, you know, a benevolent, compassionate life. This is a guy who is going through this process of redemption and in order to do this, he's not going to get there by just trying to fake it. Like he, he already knows what the right thing to do is or how to live a life that's uh, compassionate when he hasn't developed that in himself. And he can only develop that by doing the wrong things. Um, and in this sense, in a kind of... Um, counterintuitive way the wrong things are actually the right things to do because it's all he can do and it's the only way that he that he himself can get to this place he doesn't really have any other option except for to basically you know play out his destiny how these uh, circumstances have aligned themselves for him which is I mean it's like it's pretty and this is why I think this book is amazing um, because it, it it's 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 not perfect, you know. It's kind of it's kind of cheesy in parts. It's a little bit like you know, Pulp Fiction cheesy sci-fi in bits of it. But so, but within it, it's sort of it's a, a kind of vessel of of cheesy science fiction to get this message out there, which is much bigger than what most science fiction gets into. And and for that sense, you know, if there's a little some cheesy parts to it, that that really doesn't matter because that that's just sort of the um, the. Uh, uh, the container for it, right? And so, I, I think this this the book is much better than if you compare it to, um, uh, you know, Blade Runner. I mean, we've got these themes of like, oh, is uh, is Deckard really an android or not? Um, and you know, that that in itself is kind of itself kind of superficial compared to what this is pointing at and to see it's not really about artificial intelligence and 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 all this kind of stuff it's about um the, these kind the 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 artificial becoming real kind of like pinocchio becoming the real boy kind of thing and that it's even as um it, as a human being that that in to the extent that we are um fake and phony even as human beings that we we kind of profess ourselves to be caring benevolent empathic or empathetic people um but that that could just be you know we want to put that face on that mask on so that society looks at us in a good light um and in that sense as kind of a symbol you know it's uh is that that could be compared to an android which is programmed to look like it's empathetic or it's programmed to look like it's sympathetic, empathetic, all this kind of stuff. But uh, you know, the 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 in the, the real deal is is that Android's empathy actually real? Or is is this just a facade um, uh, uh, been put on? And then the sort of interplay between the facade becoming real, or what it was intended to be real, turning into a facade through what you could say is you know kippleization, um, something like that. Well, I think this is like, we're coming up to 45 minutes now. For the sake of not, like, there's, I haven't really gone much into Buster Friendly and some other things like that, but I'm going to leave it at this as being a good, you know, essential theme for Blade Runner, or, I mean, and <laughs> Androids, uh, do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and perhaps I'll make another video where I go into those other themes, um, but as, as a component 
one, a, a first, a, a, uh, part one of, of an analysis of this book. I'm, I'll conclude it there.